Welcome to the Republican Professor. This morning we have with us an incredibly extra califragilistically special guest, Dr. Eric Greenberg. I always love hanging out with this guy. Thank you for being here, Dr. Greenberg. I, I, I appreciate that very much, Dr. Mather. It's uh, always great to see you. I have a lot of love and respect for you. And I had a blast on your show last time. What was it, about five or six months ago? Um, Not quite. It was only yeah. about three, two or three months ago. Can you believe it? Time flies. Time go, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm supposed to read an ad because we have an ad finally. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone said I needed to have ads. So I said, well, I don't know who would pay us besides us. So I'm paying myself for the ad. Um, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, but <laughs> if you too want to start a podcast with hundreds of downloads a month, go to www.therepublicanprofessor.com and you can get the free ebook. It's four paragraphs of how you too can go to graduate school for 20 years and get all of the resources you need to start an amazing podcast that gets hundreds I mean, hundreds of nerds all across the country and even the world downloading your podcast. Go to www.therepublicanprofessor.com for more information. Okay, that's our ad. It's so, very well, you know, you, you got obviously a professional to, uh, to read the ad. I'm very impressed. How did you afford you. the person? <laughs> yeah, well, um, when I was a kid, I learned my first lesson of finance and my parents were stressed out about paying bills. And uh, I think it was a credit card bill. And I, I said, what's a credit card? And they said, well, it's, uh, it's this thing right here. And you go and you, you, you use it as, you know how sometimes mommy doesn't uh, write a check at the grocery store. And I said, yeah. And I said, and, and we, we give this to the person, the cashier, and they uh, let us have the groceries and we don't have to pay for it right then. Rather, we pay the person that gave that card. We pay them later. And I said, okay, well, then when you pay them later, why don't you just use another credit card? Because then you never have to pay it. So this is my, the, this is the beginning of my enlightenment of, <laughs> it's so good to see you, Eric. It's really good to see you too. I've been looking forward to our continuation of our discussion yeah, and, and I love speaking with you. You know, I, I just, you're, you're an amazing human being, a brilliant human being and, and a, oh, a so level-headed human being. And even if we don't agree on every single thing, yeah. I just love having open discussions with you. And I appreciate this. Yeah, no censorship here. I love that you're pro free speech. Oh, it's yeah. such an old school value. Just letting people have their view and just like, just, no, well, it's okay. Just have mm -hmm. your view and then talk about it. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> well, I thought about you this week because I was chatting with uh, someone uh, that used to be a, a, I almost said used to be a former colleague. Uh, <laughs> that is currently a former colleague. That's a, that's a more accurate way of saying it. Uh, actually, he used to be a former colleague too, Dr. Uh, Chris Kayser, who's coming oh, on yeah. tomorrow to talk about abortion. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought he, I sh he should probably come on because of Roe. You know, we need to talk yeah. about that. And I invited uh, uh, my former professor uh, and your colleague there. Um, gosh, why am I? totally blanking on his name De o'malley chair of bioethics uh italian guy roberto roberto, yeah, roberto Delaro. Delaro. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 he's a little cagey about coming really? on yeah he needs a little bit of hand held hand holding i think but <laughs> but that's okay i mean he's got that big o'malley chair there and he's mm. maybe he got some turf he's wanting to protect or something i don't know but mm. maybe he's just tired i don't know but anyway i'd love to have roberto come on because I loved him as a professor 
And the Italian accent that he has is so endearing. And um, so I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to stop uh, trying to get him to come on. He wanted to have me come over and have coffee with him first. And I was like, I told him, I said, Roberto, you're talking to an adjunct professor. Have you seen the gas prices? This is a major thing for me. I mean, this is not a small thing for you, maybe, but it's a major thing for me to go have coffee. You didn't used to be, but I will go have coffee with you at some point. Well, anyway, I so I thought I thought about that adjunct issue of just gas prices. And of course, you came to mind. And then there was another thing that I talked about with Chris, which is um, the issue of being a former instructor at LMU. And he was uh he was emphatic that I was an infor- a former instructor at LMU. And I said, Chris, I've been an, a former instructor at LMU for a long time. I mean, what I mean by that is I started teaching at LMU in 2006. I was a former instructor in 2006 at the end of the semester. Oh, uh, right, right you're eligible for unemployment benefits at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And it would be fraud to collect unemployment benefits if you're not a former instructor. (laughs) So I pointed that out. It's funny how being full-time, it's just like these basic things. Like they don't, I, I, so I told him, I said, I reminded him kindly. I, I said, I thought it was kind. He's still coming on, so he must think it's kind too. But you know, sometimes if you're too blunt with the full timer, they take it as rudeness or whatever. But I, I just was blunt. I said, I said, Chris, I have been a former instructor while I was <laughs> every year, over and over again, many times. I'm used to being unemployed and a former instructor. So, I mean, if I had to keep updating websites to re- reflect that, you know, you'd be updating it every June, and then, you know. Anyway, yeah. so it's just like these nitpicky little things that we, we talk about. And I'm like, let's just talk about abortion. Let's talk about your, your specialty. <laughs> Good to see you, though. You're, you're still, what are you doing this summer? Well, recording what, this in the I, summer? what aren't I doing? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, just a little reminder for yourself and for your viewers. So I finally did get a full-time but non-tenure track job at Loyola Marymount as of a, a little over a year ago. So it was a new position that they created um, with, with me in mind in interreligious dialogue. And I'm very grateful for that. And, and I just want to state publicly as often as possible about how grateful I am for that. Because I'm really, I'm big on gratitude. And I know that people like us, we tend to, we complain a lot about the injustices of the world. And so from time to time, I feel it's very important to show our gratitude. I even have a little a little laser inscribed rock here that says gratitude to remind me to, to show gratitude for things so that I don't come off as just another whiny, complainy adjunct, former adjunct professor. But anyway, so I have been occupying this um, clinical assistant professorship in interreligious dialogue since, um, I guess, August of 2021. And so for the first time in my life, really, I actually have summers off. Not that a professor ever has summers off, but at least we're not flipping, um, you know, I'm not flipping burgers. We're doing the equivalent, the academic equivalent of flipping burgers during the summers. Um, I'm actually researching and writing. And I am trying, I'm working very hard to uh, finish my memoir, which is not merely a memoir, but it is a very, it's kind of a, wide-ranging, multifarious, multivalent work that is a theological work. It is a memoir. It talks about um, elder care, compulsive hoarding, mental illness, uh, why bad things happen to good people, the the question of the problem of human suffering. Uh, It talks about a variety of different things, but focuses on my family and dealing with my parents' decline and passing in 2012 and 2013, and how that in a lot of ways sparked my union-related work trying to reform higher education, and how that also plays into my theological development as a person, a a spiritual, religious person. So it really deals with a lot of different subjects. I've been working on it for 12 years. 
At this point, I'm approaching about a thousand pages. I may have to break it up into three distinct works once it's all done to in order to actually make it marketable when I try to publish it. But bottom line, that's what I've been doing this summer, uh, doing a lot of my interfaith work, but also focusing on that memoir. And so what we're talking about today regarding adjuncts and unions is very salient because I was just finishing that chapter in my book over the last several days. I was just finishing and editing the chapter that talks about my involvement in uh, the adjunct movement. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you. That's that's very powerful. Uh, it's moving. I love how vulnerable you are. Um, you know, that's some vulnerable stuff you mentioned there. Yeah. Mental well, illness. Thank you for recognizing that. Yeah, and and lately I've been, you know, kind of writing little blurbs to describe what the book is about because it's very hard to describe. But I, I I've characterized it as an intensely personal book, wow. largely autobiographical but an intensely personal book where I expose my innermost workings, fears, hopes, dreams, uh, even, even my moments of anger and doubt at God, the, you know, a very classically Jewish wrestling with God, wrestling with the concept of God, and how do we understand God, and talking right. about the development and growth of my perception of God, and who God is, and what is my relationship to God. So, yeah, there's a lot of very personal stuff in there. Well, you live, you, you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk of interreligious dialogue. So you are what I would call a true believer in, in the First Amendment and, and in creating space for community that, you know, because community doesn't just grow on trees anymore. It seems like you have to be intentional about it more and more with how polarized people are um geographically it seems like there's more challenges to community too i mean just with technology the technology that people hold in their hand it's like uh someone could be located in a space it's a little ironic that i'm saying this on on zoom here but <laughs> but you and i are both in southern california right now mm -hmm. i'm in orange county you're in la la county right Still? yes okay and then <clears throat> But what I notice is with phones and stuff, it's like we uh, we're a little bit overwhelmed with um, communities that are not near us. Um, they're they're mediated by the web. They're mediated by social media, the rankings, the algorithms. So. You know, it's, I don't even know if I would call it a real community. I guess in some sense it is, can be, could be, but uh, you, you really carve out space for creating community. And I, 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 I commend you for that. I think that that's, that's right in line with the mission of the Academy. Mm. Um, so it's, it's particularly gratifying for me to see that you have full-time employment finally at in the academy and that you're continuing to do this. And then this memoir that you're doing, do you have a name for it? Yes. Um, I have been calling it a working title and I think I've pretty much settled on it. I'm calling it the exile for a variety of reasons. Um, there is a period of time early in the book where I describe uh, how my parents um, were uh, physically and legally removed from their home because my mother was a compulsive hoarder and the home became literally unsafe to live in. And so they were essentially exiled from their home for about four, four and a half months while they were mandated to clean the place up. And I had to very actively go cross country and spearhead the project of cleaning out the home so that my parents could get back into the home, but I characterized that period of time in our lives as a family as the exile. And um, I was very much cognizant of the connections to the, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel, the people Israel being exiled from Ha'am Yisrael during the Babylonian period. We talk about the Babylonian exile or captivity in 587 BC. Um, and in a lot of ways, I was making a connection between that 
moment in the period of, of ancient Israelite history and the lives of our family being exiled from our home. But it continues even beyond that. The book, you know, things in our lives just kept on happening. And I couldn't end the book only with that one event. And I continued to talk about my parents as they declined their health and um, ultimately when they passed. And I related it to even myself being exiled from my natural family and exiled from my homeland in New York, where I grew up, uh, and exiled from um, the, the extended family that I grew up with. And a lot of that has to do with the way that higher education is now, where people have to go elsewhere in the country to find some kind of employment. But it's not just higher education. I think it's a lot of jobs where we are being required to seek work wherever we can find it. And we're being exiled from the communities that we grew up in, that in previous generations were very close-knit communities where all the cousins lived on the same block in three or four different adjacent houses. So the, the name of the book is The Exile. And uh, if I have to divide it up into a couple of different books to get it published, then probably it will be The, the Exile Trilogy. Yeah, that's great. For those for those who are on their maybe a little bit uh, closer to the beginning of their journey of, of biblical literacy, um, I love that you're using the biblical imagery like that. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. I'm I'm struck by how open you are with or how did you did you have shame at all? And oh, if so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I had shame growing up. Well, in many ways, of course, I was the weird nerdy kid who ate health food and took vitamins and didn't wear tube socks, you know, in the 1970s. So everything about me was was shameful. Um, but then beyond that, then realizing, hey, we have this weird syndrome where my mom collects things and I can't have friends over to my house. And why can't I have friends over to my house? Why are we cagey about letting people inside the house? And, and back then when I was a kid, it was still somewhat livable and presentable. It was really only in my 20s and into my 30s that it became um, pathological to the point where it was unsanitary, unhygienic, and illegal. So, so the, the shame gradually increased over the years, and, um, and we as a family had to deal with that shame of, of putting a name on it, because when I was growing up and in, the tw in my 20s, there was no name to, to that sort of syndrome, that ailment. It was just, well, your mom's a pack rat. She's a collector. Your house is messy. We didn't know what it was, and I think it was really only the Dr. Phil show that publicized the the idea of compulsive hoarding as an ill as an illness, and I was grateful to have that name to be able to attach to what was going on in my family. And and so yeah, there was a lot of shame, but we we got past that shame when we realized we need to heal from this. I need to heal. My mom needs to heal. I mean, we tried very hard as a family to heal. Um, we did what we could. It was not as successful as it might have been. But in the process, I've had to get past that shame in telling the story. Um, and I think I've done a reasonable job in getting past that shame because it is shameful to, to think you're, you're weird, you're abnormal, there's something wrong with you, there's something wrong, something wrong with your family. Why do you people collect things? It's dirty, you know? <clears throat> oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Oh. Oh, no do, you, do you mind it? Do you mind um, just describing a little bit of it? Um, oh, yeah. That would be maybe a, an example of of uh, what prompted the shame. Um, because I, I I'm just so amazed that to me that's amazing thing that you're you're pushing through that. I don't know if you call it pushing or whatever, but but the shame is there, or, or it was there. Mm -hmm. and you're taking that pain because shame is painful mm -hmm. and you're taking that pain and you're being productive with it which mm -hmm. i think is redemptive that's an, a redemptive story right there yeah yeah thank you yeah. <clears throat> yeah i think if i had to come up with some examples of moments that we felt shame or that i felt shame the one that comes to my mind was 
uh, my college girlfriend, I think it was my, the summer after my junior year of college, she was from Maryland. I mean, this is, I, I was in New York. You, you're, you remember I'm a New Yorker by birth. So uh, we had gone to college in Connecticut at Wesleyan University. The girlfriend lived in Maryland and we wanted to be able to see each other over the summer. And there was that, that thought of, well, why don't I come and visit you? And then she wanted to come and visit me on Long Island. And my mom would not let her enter the house, let alone stay in the house. Um, and I remember she had to, ultimately she, she had to uh, stay in her van out in the driveway, which, I mean, we can discuss whether that was in fact a, a um, passive aggressive move in and of itself. But the, the point is that my mom had to kind of get over the fact that this is a messy house and she doesn't want to show it to people. There's a guest sleeping in their car out in the driveway we need to invite her in and just get over the fact that this is a mess so that was one of the instances uh, the same girlfriend uh, wanted to visit me again and we wound up having to put her up at a friend's house nearby and I'm thinking why does this girlfriend have to stay at the friend's house when we have a perfectly good house at our house with four walls and a roof you know so it was moments like that that were very shame producing for me um, even more so than that were very dear friends of ours, this is years later, uh, dear friends of ours on Long Island that my parents became very close with, um, and we were never able to invite them over to our house. We were always invited over to their house, but we never could invite them over to our house. And for the longest time, they didn't know. They thought maybe we were neat, free neat freaks. My mother was always saying, oh, our home's being redecorated. We're, we're still renovating. We're still renovating. We'll have you over sooner or later. And then uh, ultimately, it all came out. The, the floodgates opened when uh, when the, the town authorities got involved and um, what they call placarded the place. It's not an actual condemnation. It's it's one step short of that. But they placard the place and say, you are not permitted to live here until such time as these conditions are satisfied. And so at that point was when the family friends realized, OK, it isn't that mom is a neat freak. It isn't that they're having the place renovated she's a compulsive hoarder. And, uh, and that was a very shame producing moment for everyone to see we're the weirdos. People already knew we were a little bit odd, but we're the weirdos. Yeah. Gotcha. We're pathological. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what was the hell? What were some of the health conditions or one, one example of the health condition that they were concerned about? Was it the, like the sharing? Main? Yeah, I don't mind sharing at all. And people can read about it in my tell-all book, The Exile, hopefully coming out in the next year. You're uh, getting snippets of uh, this book. So, Yeah, uh, the main concerns that the town authorities, and these were good people. I do not blame the town inspectors at all. They saved my parents' lives. But at the time, it was, it was scary, of course. But the main things they focused on was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, issues of, of fire safety, and egress, that they wanted my parents to be able to exit the house if necessary. God forbid there was a, a fire, an earthquake, a heart attack, whatever it is, you need to be able to gain uh, egress from any of the uh, the exits, the, the, the actual exits of the house. And at the time, you couldn't. The place was just really, it was, it was chock full of junk up to the level of a of a person's neck. There were places where the piles of gotcha. newspaper and junk were that high. And there may be maybe spots in between the piles where you could jump from spot to spot in order to gain access to the, the egress. And so that was the main gotcha. thing. Was egress. That, um, that's a, that's helpful uh, because it, it paints a picture that it was, it, that there was that, that, that was how much stuff you're talking about is moving yes. into in and out was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to emphasize that my parents were highly functional people. So it's like their private life was entirely separate from their public life. My dad had been a school teacher for upwards of 30 years. My mother was a, a kind of a nutritional consultant. She was always the first to help people anytime there was some type of an emergency that friends or family needed to be helped. These were highly functional, loving brilliant people but right there just this issue that they could not get past and it was yeah. even though my mother was the active hoarder my dad was the uh the enabler and the two of them were part yeah. of it. And yeah on some level i was part of it by not being able to 
put my foot down as the adult son and say, no, this will not continue. So on some level I was involved, you know? Yeah. So there was, there's some kind of uh, pain that your mom had. There was a trauma or something. There was a grief. Yes. I think it's associated with grief uh, yeah. where you have, you attach value to items that mm -hmm. ordinarily we wouldn't attach uh, value to items that would be uh, recycled or thrown away. Um, it, it could be knickknacks. It could be stuff like that. You might stuff that you might find at a swap meet or at a, you know, an antique shop or a garage sale or something like that. Uh, ordinarily people don't buy uh, something like this at a garage sale, but I would probably throw this away, you know, and I'm holding up just a, just a, a an ordinary food package you might find at the uh you know for breakfast or something uh, at, at trader joe's or something like that yeah. but there's an attachment of sentimental value uh, there's a memory there's a somehow there's there's a a feeling of safety uh for their nervous system uh maybe a panic that uh, the memory or their story will be lost mm -hmm. forever if that now is thrown away yeah because yeah. of the the symbolic thing do i have that right is that your you are understanding? absolutely correct i am not a i'm not a professional i am not a psychologist but my understanding having read about this and having also accompanied my mom through the therapy because she's been in therapy for this for many many years we had a number of different family counselors and and my understanding is you're absolutely correct and in her case she was a a very severely abused child and that's also part of the book in that i am trying to tell the stories that she shared with me that she conveyed to me because she's no longer able to tell them she is deceased now and so so i'm here to tell the stories that she told me so as to raise awareness with my readers about child abuse about pedophilia in its many forms about the kind of abuse and and even we can talk about human trafficking that's that's involved in that uh, i want people to be aware of that and the fact that that sort of thing it has very far-reaching repercussions or ripples that continue to affect the families of the victims themselves and so here we are a generation later i'm dealing with the fallout from my mother's abuse and possibly even my father's abuse he may have been abused as well we're not sure it was my mother who was much more vociferous about it and so we're very sure that a lot of her hoarding was connected as a as a, a response to the the abuse I, I so i would agree with you yeah did she ever talk about it with you the abuse but, itself yeah 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 how did how did you come to know about it um Right about when I was, um, I think it was my senior year of college, she had had a, a memory of the abuse. So she had a dissociative episode um, where she began to relive one of these events in her early childhood. And, and I witnessed her having that dissociative episode. And we brought her to the family therapist who confirmed, yes, this is what it is. It is a dissociative episode. She'll be fine. But they started working intensely on getting that abuse out. And so she started remembering all of these several years of abuse that she had submerged. So this is an example of one of those uh, um, repressed or submerged memories stories that I know sometimes people are skeptical of, but I know a lot of psychologists, a lot of professionals are, are very much uh, accepting that this sort of thing does happen with the human mind, that people can and do repress yeah. traumatic memories. Did so that's she, how we found about hers. Did she, did you get a sense of what age this happened at and yeah. what the nature of it was? Mm -hmm. Any sense yeah. of that at all? Yeah. Uh, she, she informed me and shared with me a lot of it. And that's why I feel I need to tell this. So of course it's coming secondhand, but as best I can remember the stories as she's conveyed them to me, but I would say the worst of it probably started when she was about three and ended when she was about seven, which was when she could start to fight back and become more of a, um, a what would you call it, a, a, a threat to her abusers, um, a, a 
you know, a viable threat that this kid is going to kick back or this kid might tell somebody or something like that. Um, <clears throat> there may have been earlier abuse, but the majority of it was from about three to seven. It involved her maternal grandfather, her own mother, and possibly a, well, yeah, as she describes it, a group of friends of her grandfather. So, uh, you know, and this is before this is before the days of the Internet. So you couldn't go onto the dark web and and say, hi, I'm a pedophile looking for other pedophiles out there so we can abuse children together, you know, willing to travel or, you know, you, you couldn't do that. That didn't exist. But somehow these people found each other and there evidently was a group of friends. I don't know how many, you know, three, five more uh, that kind of gravitated around her maternal grandfather and uh, and they would abuse her periodically in a a physical and sexual nature. And um, sometimes it involved alcohol to, to try to, uh, you know, to, to subdue her. Um, so, yeah, and I won't go into too much detail here just for a variety of reasons, but she gave me all sorts of very gory, gruesome uh, stories that I've tried to include in the book in a way that does not come off as sensationalistic or like looky loo, or or even I don't know quasi pornographic because I'm sure somebody out there would read this with an eye toward that, and I'm I'm trying not to sound that that way or to cater to that audience. This the reason I'm doing this as to testify, to demonstrate this happened, and even if the perpetrators themselves are no longer living, which they are not, you know at least I can call them out across time, and I can say this was done, and we're holding them accountable. Yeah. I'm remembering their names, you know. I think of the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. Of course, the King James Version I'm giving yeah. you there. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing I thought of when you're, you describe this, is that you're, you, you know, I don't think of that commandment as for children. Mm. I think of it for adults. And it's interesting that we have to be commanded to do that yeah you know there's obviously a temptation hmm. to not do it i mean if it was just natural right i mean it's at natural most of the time for me not to murder <laughs> right <laughs> but <laughs> there are times <laughs> when it's really helpful to have that background knowledge that this is not something you can do you can't do this. And so yeah. this positive command, you know, you think of the, take the Sabbath. That's also really deep too. But the the command to, to honor your father and your mother, it, it's obvious. I, I mean, I take that to be evidence that obviously God has um, common sense. I mean, I hope so. We're doing <laughs> theology already. Does God had, have come? So, so, I mean, obviously there'd be enough. Uh, it would be in a background of understanding that parents are not perfect. Parents yeah. come with a host of issues and problems and trauma, sadness, grief, anger, uh, illnesses. And yet we have this simple command to honor mm -hmm. them. And so how do you think, how do you process that command, uh, the outer bounds of it? What, what counts as honoring? What counts as dishonoring? Do you ever, yeah. have you thought deeply about that? And I know you have. But. Yeah, I, I have. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I don't, I don't know if I have ever put it in those terms specifically that what I'm doing is honoring my mother and father, but even though on an unconscious level, I'm sure that's what I, that's what I knew I was doing, but I've thought about this very deeply. Absolutely. Um, there are situations where a parent may give what one might call in the military, as you well know, an illegal order, you know, when you're, you're I don't know, your parent might do something just horrible. There are people out there who are drug addicts and their parents might, I don't know, their parents might be selling drugs. So do you obey your parent is, is obedience the long and the short of honoring them. 
maybe it would it would honor them to disobey them by by saying mom and dad no i'm not going to help you sell drugs or help you take drugs in that way i am honoring you by disobeying you so yeah it's interesting how you mentioned that it's not really a commandment for children it seems more of a commandment for the adults and their parents but so with children children generally are taught to obey because they don't know enough to know the difference between a lawful command and an unlawful command. But as adults, or at least teenagers, maybe we have more of a, a conscience or a, a sense of, of reason. So we can say, yeah, I honor you, mom and dad, but I'm not going to keep helping you bring junk into the house. And I'm going to help get that junk out of the house. Um, and so as I move forward, I'm honoring them by, by preserving their memories, by talking about how these things happened and how it can happen to other people in the world. And I, and I want to um, use their, their story as a cautionary tale for other people that maybe even other children of, of hoarders, and there's groups out there on the internet, support groups, uh, often called something like that, adult children of hoarders or children of hoarders or whatever. And there's a lot of us out there who are struggling with, with that question of what do you do to honor your parents when your parent is doing something really sick that's harmful to themselves or harmful to those around them? What's the best way to honor them? Sometimes the best way to honor them is to disobey them and call adult protective services or call the, the town safety department or whatever it is to get that parent help, even if they don't want it. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah. That's really yeah, good. Thank you. thank you. Well, and I also think of your own mother. And she, you know, as a three-year-old mm -hmm. is not under that command yeah. for that activity mm -hmm. that does not count as honoring her own mother or her own grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, not that she would be thinking that at that time, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to think about the, the boundaries. Thanks for being so vulnerable with, with that. That's oh, uh, my, my pleasure. I, I, may, I, may I you say, I'm going to pray a blessing over you. Okay. May you sell a million copies. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're going to help a lot of people, I hope. Yeah. Well, uh, now let's, uh, you want to get into unions a bit today? Adjuncts and unions. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, Swift, I mean, I love the switch we, gears. Yeah, I appreciate that you gave me room to talk about these other issues, but I sure. I didn't want to uh, you know wind up talking so much about that that we forget the unions or forget about adjuncts. Absolutely. When your book <laughs> comes out, I'll go back and edit the episode notes and put a link to it. That's great. Yeah, That's great. So I, I don't want to forget about the book because the book is a really important. I, I there I want to go back to how you linked the book with union work. Mm -hmm. So you're taking your story and your pain, your situation, your shame and all that, the whole thing, vulnerability. I, I said, it's just vulnerability and your uh, desire to contribute to the academy and to, to the next generation of, of Americans and mm -hmm. well, all around the world now, because we have international students there at Loyola Marymount. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what's the link with unions? Uh, how does this story uh, get you thinking about that? Yeah. So I was teaching from 2003. My first academic appointment was at Loyola Marymount uh, in 2003. It was a, a single part-time class. And almost immediately, they offered me a visiting position, which is a, one of those uh, non-tenure track, this is for your, your listeners, of course, uh, non-tenure track, but full-time renewable annual contract. Um, so they offered me one of those the, the next semester. And I, so I was in that position for the next two years as a full-time visiting professor. Um, and then after the second year, the contract ended, they hired somebody to teach uh, in a tenure track job in that particular field. And, and so I was out on my butt. They didn't need me anymore. And so it was it was difficult for a couple of years trying to cobble together a living, working at other schools in the L.A. area, doing consultation work, so forth. Um, about after a three year hiatus, LMU hired me back this time as a part timer. And so from 2008 onwards, 
I was a um, a part timer every semester. So um, during that time period, you know, I'm cobbling together a living, making a relatively small amount of money at Loyola Marymount and still occasionally teaching at other universities, just trying to cobble together a living. And this is when my parents, um, their health was starting to decline. That's when the exile happened. That happened in 2009. So during that whole period, I'm trying to manage their care and also earn a living to try to support my wife and me. At the time, she was the bigger breadwinner. She had a full-time job and we were relying upon my half-time or two-thirds time job um, in addition. So times were tough financially. And so during this whole time, I'm thinking I would like to be able to spend more time with my parents who are a country away. They're on the East Coast. I am on the West Coast. I'm very close with them. I want to spend more time with them. I want to take care of them as a as, a, as I believe a son should. That this is part of older generations where family members took care of older family members, but I felt like I did not have the economic opportunity to do so because of the way that academia was constructed, or at least the way that it has developed in the last 50 years, where people are required to move far away from where they grew up just in order to get a job. And so during that period, I started having a lot of resentment towards the way academia was. And as my parents declined and I wasn't able to physically be in their vicinity because I couldn't afford to keep flying back and forth cross country or to move them across country to live with me because I didn't have enough money to have a house with an extra bedroom. You know, we rent here. So all these things brewed in my mind through 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, finally, after they died, in 2012 and 2013, two months apart from each other on, on, on opposite sides of New Year's. Um, after that, it became very clear to me that if I had had a full-time tenure track job, things would have been a little different with my parents. I would have had the ability to move them in with me or have a summer where I can go spend time with them and, and really manage their care. Um, summer of 2013, just a few months after their deaths, I had to go to New York. I emptied out the family home, tried to get it ready for rental so that we could try to keep it in the family because my grandfather built that house. So it was very important to me to keep it. Um, and so I came back to That's LA. the house on Long Island? That's right. That's the house on Long Island. What was the town um, again? In, uh, in uh, Dix Hills. Dix where, Hills, okay. Dix Hills, yeah, which is part of Huntington. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, yeah. So um, we, um, you know, I, I, I had spent the whole summer emptying out every last thing that was left over in the house as much as I could handle um, and came back to the West Coast and started up teaching again. And uh, in this intervening time, I'm having certain family members who are builders and contractors they're taking care of some of the renovations in the house to try to get it ready for rental but during this time is when the service employees international union or the seiu they reached out to our school um and they started trying to unionize on campus and it was at that moment when they contacted me for for my support as one of the adjuncts that i thought yeah things would have been very different if academia had treated me the way that they would have treated my counterpart 40, 50 years ago, where you get your PhD or whatever terminal degree is in your field, and you go out and you, you, you work hard, you, you get a job, a tenure track job, you publish, and you have a nice cushy life. You work hard, but you get paid for it. And it has been very different than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's been a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight. Um, but it was during that time period that I realized I'm mad. I'm mad as hell <laughs> that I played by the rules. I did what, as I, what I was told. And yet academia did not support me the way that they said they would support me. And my parents died. What would I say? Uh, yeah, you know, while I, was, while I was away, while I was looking away, I was trying to work on my career. And I missed all this time with my parents. It takes a lot of focus and yeah. a long time to do the deep work necessary for being a successful professor, the way mm -hmm. it's set up. 
Um, the, uh, the, the book I'm kind of the title I just used was, is deep work by Cal Newport. Hmm. It's a, it's a book by Cal Newport, deep work it's called. Hmm. Interesting. And so you, yeah, yeah. I, I experienced a similar thing when my parents died, I was so involved in teaching and, and studying that I, I, did feel like it just walloped me like all of a sudden they're gone my house the house i grew up in is gone mm. it took me by surprise and it mm-hmm. it's something i'm still dealing with actually mm. so yeah to that point okay my condolences yeah yeah um you know I'll, I'll add to something you said about how it takes deep work it also takes a lot of luck because and i'll remind your viewers that um only about 25% of all higher education faculty in the United States at this point are on the tenure line, meaning that they either have tenure or tenure track jobs. The remaining 75% of all higher ed faculty are off the tenure line, meaning they are either adjuncts teaching one or two courses here and there, or they are uh, some other contingent labor, uh, visiting professors, clinical professors, whatever. They don't have tenure, they will never have tenure. They are usually teaching gigs that are either semester to semester or year to year or something like that. And um, and this did not happen overnight. This was a gradual process where in the late 1960s up to about 1970, the, the statistics were the exact opposite. 75% of all higher ed faculty were on the tenure line, meaning they were tenured or tenure track. So if you worked hard, you published, you did a good job, you would have tenure, you'd have a cushy life. Not to say they never, that they didn't work. I'm just saying that there was a process. And if you followed the process, there would be rewards. Gradually, the numbers reversed from 1970 yeah. to about 2010, 2011, 2012. And so at this point, it's exactly the opposite. So, so it's, it's also a matter of luck. Will yeah. you ever get a tenure track job so that you can work towards tenure and have that life that we've all worked for? Um, and most people don't. The vast majority will never have that chance. Is it that there's too many PhDs, too many MAs out there? The the market is saturated, or what what's going on with the luck? How is it luck? Right. Sometimes people will suggest that oh, there's just too many PhDs. The market is saturated. Whether or not that's true, I mean, maybe there's some truth to that. Also, there are plenty of classes to be taught. See, that's, and, and that's why even if there are too many PhDs out there, there are still plenty of classes to be taught because most of those people are actually teaching. They're teaching classes. They're just not teaching classes at the same place. So there are plenty of classes to be taught, but you've got one person who's teaching a class here, there, and there. Two, three, four separate institutions. So if somehow we could get our act together and coordinate so that We've got one person teaching those three or four classes here, one person at that university teaching those three or four classes and so forth. So we don't have people constantly doing this um, musical chairs type of a scenario where we're trading classes with each other, working all over the same city. We call them freeway flyers. I know you were a freeway flyer. I was a little bit of a freeway flyer where we have to finish up our class real quick and then get into our cars and drive that freeway real quick onto the other side of town to teach another class at another university. So yes, there are plenty of classes that need to be taught. There are plenty of students that need to be taught. There are, I would say, hypothetically, the right number of professors to teach those classes. It's a matter of the universities don't want to continue to sustain and offer tenure lines so that you can keep those good professors in one place. That is the problem. That's the primary problem. It's an economics problem. It's a management problem. It's an institutional and systemic problem. Yeah. And you mentioned the 60s and 70s, or did you say the 60s and 70s or the 50s and 60s? I can't remember. But it, the, the, the good times 60s. pretty much ended in the late 60s. The, most of our right. statistics where we start seeing a decline is about right about 1970. All right. So this is... Um... That that's a time back in the 60s when the faculty had much more control over the institution, I think. 
yeah. relative to the faculty numbers, the, the number of administrators was far lower, right? Yes. That, mm -hmm. Would you say that's fair? And the administrators, um, that's, it's, a, it's, it's a different thing being an administrator. It's, it's a full-time job. You don't have adjunct administrators, right? Rarely. You don't, you don't have like, yeah, I, we're going to give you this contract. It starts in late August, mm -hmm. Dean, Dean, so-and-so, you know, I'm uh, just going to offer three -way flyer offer. administrators, you know, yeah. Dean, so-and-so I know you're also Dean at the community college about an hour away. And you, are you still there? Or, okay. You haven't been renewed for this semester. Okay. Well, we'll give you a part-time it's three hours. You can be a dean for three hours a week. We'll pay you four and a half hours. Just, you know, but uh, you know, that's not how they 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 chop up the labor. Yeah. They don't. Not they, at, they want the administrator school. to be full time. In fact, they're there over the summer. Yeah, they're Is available you know I mean? over Christmas break. Mm -hmm. Even if they're sitting there in their admin offices and saying this is not Christmas break. <laughs> that's right you know i will i will offer an alternate what you're supposed to say when you're an administrator sorry go ahead some of the uh yeah some of the small startup schools in la some of which are religiously run those schools however will often hire part-time administrators and i was one of those at one of the korean funded institutions it was a religious you. school that i was at but that is super rare that's the and only that's time i've ever heard of it schools. yeah yeah it's not that's at accredited true. schools yeah most definitely gotcha. not yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of an adjunct administrator. So it's interesting. I mean, you don't see the administrators talking to SEIU because they're, <laughs> and, the, and that, that itself, I think is interesting to think about because you mm -hmm. mentioned the sixties, where did all these administrators come from and why? I mean, they're obviously guarding their chunk of the pie. Mm -hmm. the, the, the students cannot keep paying a larger and larger tuition bill every semester. Mm -hmm. They just can't. Yeah. Cuz you will start losing students. Mm -hmm. There is a there is a number where you'll get the number of students you need given the resources available. And then the, the, you got some bean counter that's trying to figure that out. It's not a professor that's trying to figure that out. The professor is writing their nerdy academic article and you know, they're they're doing their professor stuff, but, mm -hmm. but th there's some kind of admin person that's dealing with the number stuff, how many students we have. And it's, it's, it's hard because these students are not under contract. They're not under, there's no obligation for, a, for students to come pay this enormous bill. So you're mm -hmm. constantly dangling all sorts of college experience candy in front of them. And then there's the fear of being sued in the, in the new regulatory environment, which is new since the sixties. Mm -hmm. That's really why the administrators are there is it's a tremendous yeah. fear on the part of the institution mm -hmm. that they're somehow vulnerable. And there's a cost benefit analysis that's taken place where they're like, okay, we can mitigate that fear that we have. If we pay X number of dollar signs in salary to people who are here all the time whose sole job is to keep us not only well booked with students but also the complaints low legal every kind of complaint low from the classroom to the courtroom yeah. and so that's why you don't have adjunct administrators <laughs> and so from the administrator point of view because I think oftentimes administrators don't have very much teaching experience. So they, they might say they do, but they don't. They don't mm -hmm. really know. They don't have the kind of teaching experience that I do, for example. They don't know what it's like to go behind, between schools. They don't know what that does to the student or they're inured to it for some reason. Um, and so the, the, the administrator doesn't think about what's happening to higher education. They just think about their own jobs. They think about what, like, for example, how does the student experience 
an adjunct professor that's not adequately supported like you were when you're going through your stuff, the full timer, they're going through their own stuff too. But the profession of professoring, which used to be highly regarded, the profession, the profession for them uh, provides a, um, a context. I almost said a cushion, but I don't think that's the right word. A, uh, a context where they can, their personal stuff is contained more or less. They're not leaking into the classroom, in other words. Mm. But as an adjunct, there is no context where your personal stuff is contained. Yeah, It's leaking into the classroom. It's leaking into office hours. I can't tell you how many times in office hours, I'm looking at my watch and I'm looking at traffic because mm -hmm. i'm thinking about tra you know is there an accident on pch because i got to get to pepperdine right or is there an accident on the 405 i got to get up to la mission college yeah there and it's many, dis many. it's disorienting it's disorienting yeah. for for the student mm -hmm. and it's not good for the student it's not mm -hmm. good for education it's not good for the institution yeah one of the um the mottos that we came up with in the union movement back in 20 you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, was that uh, teaching conditions are learning conditions. So the conditions that the professor is in and what they're dealing with, those are going to impact the student, if not directly, then indirectly. And the student will not have access to the same professor when they need them during convenient office hours. They won't have a certain uh, ability to keep in touch with that professor from semester to semester for mentorship, for recommendations, because that professor might not be here next year or the year after. They might be halfway across the world somewhere else. Um, so there are many ways in which it does affect the student um, adversely. And um, yeah, and it's, you're right, there's, there's, there's a lack of containment of our personal issues. They're always going to be um, leaking into the classroom or into office hours, most most definitely. Um, and I could go on and on about that. It, it's yeah. interesting what you had said about the um, the administrators, because one of the principles of higher education, you know this, of course, but I'm repeating it for your for your viewers. One of the principles uh, undergirding higher education is the principle of shared governance. And then this is part of uh, even some of the the AAUP, or American Association of University Professors, some of the principles that they established in the earlier part of the 20th century that, that, that supposedly undergird and, and help to produce a good experience in academia. And, and the principle of shared governance is that all of the stakeholders, all of the participants in the academic exercise are supposed to have some level of say in how we govern our school. So it's not just the president or the provost or the board of directors that says, hey, you know what, we're going to open up a new gymnasium or we're going to have new tennis courts. That's we're going to how, how we're going to spend our $1 million contribution from, you know, from Warren Buffett or whatever. Whereas we've got all levels of professors, students, staff members contributing on some level to the decision making process. What is best for this school? hey, well, it really would be nice if we had that new tennis court because we've got a lot of new incoming uh, tennis stars who can help raise money for the school since they're national, uh, nationally rated. But wouldn't it be nice if we had uh, classrooms that didn't leak water through the ceiling every time it rained? Maybe we should spend a little more money on fixing the holes in the roof or paying a living wage to our professors. So shared governance is extremely important. It is a principle that the AAUP and all of the major accrediting bodies, um, they, they emphasize as part of the accreditation process. But from the 1970s onward, um, the, the more administrators you have, the less possibility you have for professors to participate as um, in that, that shared governance process. Uh, we talk about administrative bloat. Uh, that's a, a term that we see um, used to characterize what we were talking about earlier, where there were more and more administrators being hired through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, ostensibly 
to answer the problem of increased governmental regulation, right? That's part of it. We need to make sure that we've handled certain, uh, whether it's the Americans with Disabilities Act or, or various veterans' rights or uh, now diversity, equity, inclusion, certain matters need to be handled. And we need bean counters for that. We need administrators to make sure the university is in compliance. That's important. But in the older days, the, uh, the professors would often be asked to participate in that, that this person would in fact be an associate dean for a year or a couple of years. This person would be taking on certain administrative duties as part of their professorial um, job. Uh, of course, we still do have associate deans today who are, um, I guess you'd say, promoted from the ranks of professors, but, but it used to be much more where professors faculty were required to participate in shared governance and administration. But nowadays, we have far more administrators than we've ever had. And these people are making very good salaries. And I'm not saying they don't deserve those salaries. I'm just saying, let's have it across the board where everybody who deserves a good salary gets their good salary. That's okay, all you saying. didn't say it, but I'll say it. They don't deserve those big salaries. <laughs> So Dr. <laughs> Eric Greenberg is off the hook for that comment. <laughs> That's on me. <laughs> well, I'm not all of them. I don't mean all of them. I, I mean, yeah. but what I'm, how do you even assess whether they're, they deserve that salary? How do you, how do you assess it? I'll, I'll tell you, I have a principled way of assessing it. It's not just my feelings. Okay. It's not like I just don't like these people. Although sometimes that's true. But no, I have a, a principled way of assessing that. And that is, I look at everything from the perspective of academic excellence. That's the whole purpose. That's the telos of the academy. There's no other reason for it to exist, I think. Now, we're not talking about a trade school. We're not talking about vocational school. You want to talk about that? Okay. Then there's a certain amount of academic excellence for that as well. Depend, you know, whether you're studying refrigeration technology and gun repair, or you know, auto or whatever it is, right? Painting, I don't know, ballet. <laughs> there's going to be. It should aim toward excellence, right? And in in the case of uh, something like Loyola Marymount or the schools I was involved in, the community colleges, the Cal States the, uh, you know, Pepperdine, things like that. Um, the, the notion of deep work of Cal Newport, I think is very important. How, did the context for deep work, how are we doing at protecting that, nurturing that, nurturing mm -hmm. a sense of responsibility of growing up for the students? Uh, doing good work, having good mentoring, uh, accessibility. Um, so this that's all playing into this. And to the extent that the admin budget is encroaching on support for faculty to do that good work for the students and uh, to the extent that it's mitigating student achievement and what i mean by student achievement is um, i would measure it like this i would say well, maybe i won't tell you how i'd measure it but i will tell you the what i'm trying to measure student achievement is not just grades it's maturity increasing student maturity taking responsibility so to the extent that DI, DI diversity, inclusion, uh, equity, gets in the way of that, and to some extent it might, I don't know, I can't make that claim right now, but it might, some aspects of it might encroach on student achievement, might encroach on student maturity. It might take away from academic excellence. Other things might too, but, but that's how I would measure the uh, effectiveness of an administrator mm -hmm. uh, and you got to took, you got to take the whole thing into perspective. I think now, let me give you a very specific example. I'm going through the hiring process right now 
to be an adjunct professor. And as I'm <laughs> going through it, it's interesting. I've never taught at this place. Um, but, but, uh, so it's a new contact for me. It's just to teach one class. It's an upper level class. It's a class I've never taught before. It's a class I'm academically qualified to teach, but I've never taught it before. And I've already had uh, meetings and emails and the expectation on the part of this institution, which is a well-known school hmm. in California, it's international, it's well-known, you know, all across the nation, as far as I can tell. This, to teach this class, this upper level class, it's a very specific kind of class. And the expectation is that I will develop the course material for and all my strategies for helping these people I've never even met achieve academic excellence, helping them, not taking responsibility for them, but helping them is done while from the perspective of this school, I'm unemployed. I'm only a W-2 when the class starts mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. of course i'm expected to have a syllabus mm -hmm. on day one mm -hmm. now okay this is a very specific example of the total incoherence of the current system mm -hmm. because e let's not call into question just for a moment the entire adjunct scheme which I would like to call into question at some point. We don't have to do it this episode because you're obviously a regular here. You can do it later if you want, but we could today if you want to. But I, I would be willing to call in the in, into question the entire scheme. And maybe you could convince me of the union stuff if it's a step toward that direction. You might actually have me on that because I think the entire scheme is corrupt. Sure. The way well, it's I designed. And let me just give you a hypothetical. What if we started the adjunct contract two weeks before the semester started mm -hmm. so that the adjunct professor can put together a syllabus while they are an employee of the damn school? Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? <laughs> you know, I mean, why don't we have that kind of wiggle room? And I know it's going to have something to do with the student, the student commitments to pay, of course, and then how that interacts with the calendar year and the, the academic calendar and all that stuff. But there's bean counters can figure that out. Why? Now let me go even a further. Why don't we start the adjunct contract a month before the first day of class so that the adjunct has time to do the deep work that you tell the students they're going to enjoy when they get there, which is kind of the point of spending this godforsaken enormous amount of money to do to get this degree. I mean, it should matter at some point you're going to do deep work and become more intelligent. Well, let's recognize the depth of the material. It's not it's not the kind of thing that you know, some guy studied this in his PhD and, oh, he can come teach this class now. No, you still have to do work to prepare to uh, how you're going to explain this. What's the best reading? Is there any other readings that's come out that's more accessible? What's the pricing situation for these students? Um, you know, copyright issues. There's all sorts of ways you can, you can, uh, should I use PowerPoint? Should I not? Figuring out the technology. The technology is always being updated. So there's all sorts of things that are relevant to this. And oftentimes the, 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 uh, the institutions completely waste that opportunity to provide that kind of deep work for the student. I, I'm not, now I'm not even focusing on the professor. I'm talking about for the student. They're ripping the student off. They're mm -hmm. ripping 
the government off because the government is paying for the student to go there. They're ripping the community of America off because this student now is less educated and they're going to be sitting on a jury. They're ripping the, the criminal justice system off from a better educated juror to be able to see through the BS of the prosecutor or the defense attorney, as the case may be. Um, they're ripping America off and, and the, their state the, the, that they happen to be a citizen of, of a, a, a competent voter. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at our voting situation. If I could just spend a, 30 seconds on this, look at all the yard signs. Does that not tell you everything you need to know about our so-called so democracy? Mm. I mean, a yard sign is, you know why they have them? Because they work. Yeah. Because they work. Just merely a guy's name or a lady's name on there. And uh, <laughs> they work. <laughs> And this is a college educated society. Right. Something's deeply wrong. We need right. to push back against that. Yeah. We need to, we're not doing the deep work. We're yeah. not, we're, and we're missing basic things. Also grades are due. Let me go to the other side of the, uh, the semester <clears throat> for the adjunct. The contract ends when the grades are due. And there's usually a date. Um, sometimes there's even a time on the contract. It could be noon on um, December 18th or something. It could be uh, 5 p.m. on December 21st or something like that. Changes every semester for the, for the Christmas break. Why not extend that contract into January, like January 20th? I'm not saying you have to get the grades in by January 20th. But I'm saying, if you're a, a, a hard grader, which is another measure of academic excellence, if you're not a hard grader, chances are academic excellence is not as high. Of course, it increases student anxiety. The healthy expression of that student anxiety would be channeled to work harder. It doesn't always get channeled that way. Sometimes it's bad for the student in other ways because they need help because they're not mature then you need more resources to help that those students, but helping people grow up and take responsibility. There's always grade complaints. In my opinion, there's always great in place. It might, I, I was, let me give you another specific example. A, a fall of 2017 was the first time I was not teaching at Loyola Marymount university in 12 years. And I got contacted by the chair, Liz Murray, who I, I like as a person. She, she'd done me some solids before. I, but um, she told me that I had a, a complaint about a grade from the previous semester, which, which I knew about. I knew about immediately in the summer. I knew about it, but I was not a W-2 employee during the summer. Mm. So, so what is my duty to Loyola Marymount University? Now, there might be a moral duty. And I'm telling you, philosophy departments know how to try to exploit that. <laughs> I'm not saying she did. I'm not saying she didn't. But the implication clearly was to me, if you ever want to teach here again, you will help me with mm -hmm. this student. That's wow. how I interpreted it. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely refused to inflate the student's grade. And I was not even on the clock, for God's sake. I wasn't mm. even a, an employee, and I'm dealing with an administrative issue. Mm. And it dealt with in, grade inflation. And to my knowledge, she inflated the student's grade because I was not there to stand for academic excellence on behalf of Loyola Marymount University. She had to come in in this awkward way and, uh, you know, looking at my grade book and I, I didn't have a chance to give her some other context. It was just totally inappropriate what mm. happened. And that actually happened. Wow. I'm sorry. Mm. And I'm just telling you that is harmful. It's not just harmful for my feelings. Mm -hmm. Although I had some feelings and I still do, as you can tell, <laughs> but 
it is harmful to Loyola Marymount's reputation. It, Cause it might not happen right away, but I know in my mind, it's a different school than where I started teaching. And it's, it's, there's something sick happening. It's not, it, it's probably been there the whole time in different ways and I'm getting at it obliquely, but, but I, I, I don't want to do it from the professor's perspective. I think, the students are being harmed because hmm. it get, the word gets around the word gets around oh you complain about a grade chances are you could get a, a bump especially if he's an adjunct right because he can't defend himself and he can't defend the integrity of the grading process the integrity the academic integrity he can't do there's no resources Mm -hmm. Loyola Marymount University is sitting on a billion dollar campus. It's a wealthy school. And they don't have the resources to support academic integrity like that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't want to get us off the topic, but remind me if our last interview, had I shown you that chart? of the salaries of the upper level administration, which had come from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Did we talk about that last time? I have a vague recollection yeah. of that. Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to see it again. Later, because... Yeah, I do. I do. I, later, I realized, oh my gosh, that's not going to be available for the people on audio because uh, yes. most people access it through audio. But sure. what I could do is what I didn't do last time is I could describe for the listeners on mm -hmm. Apple podcasts, a little bit more detail about the thing. So if you want, I can share my screen. Yeah. Do you want to, uh, do you want uh, me to share I think you emailed it to me last time, or I can, why don't I let you share your screen? Let me see yeah. Cause I, I do have, have it here. Can you, can you share? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, starting that <clears throat> right now. Okay. Oh, oh it's not, Have not I... yet disabled. It says it's disabled. Okay, try now. How about that? There we go. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. And so I don't know if you're if you're going to be able to see this well enough. Um, I'll try to make it a little bit larger. So this is from the Chronicle of Higher Education. This is from uh, a little this, bit, this, a little bit more, a little bit more. There you go. Okay. Says so, David, oh, David says David Bircham, $504,464. Yeah. So this was in 2011. That was the, the last, uh, the most updated statistics that they had at the time. This was posted in 2013. So this was very salient to our union movement. When we were starting to unionize, this was the most updated information we had. And we were not happy. Um, and, and we publicized this. We used this. I mean, it's public information. It's in their, um, their nonprofit uh, federal reporting requirements to the IRS, part of their 990 form. If, you're, if your uh, listeners are familiar with that, that all nonprofits need to report their income and their revenue and their expenses to the IRS. Um, so this is public information and the Chronicle of Higher Education publicizes this. I don't know whether it's an annual thing, but anyway, this is from 2011, or the most updated dates. This is the former president, David Bertram, who by all accounts was a perfectly nice guy, but it kind of demonstrates to us the, the iniquities and the inequities of the system by comparison. So the highest paid employee of the school, the president, making a little over half a million dollars per year. And that's reasonable compared to other universities of our size. It's not outsized. It's not, oh, you're, you're on mute? Sorry, let me let me add to that. It says total compensation, right? So that would include health benefits. Yes, which are pro benefits. would not be reflected in his uh, paycheck. Right, right, exactly. So universities of this size, that's you know pretty much on par. It's not it's not outsized. I've seen other university presidents at that time that were making millions of dollars. We might say that that's a bit too much, but he was making an okay amount, but Los Angeles a is a very expensive place too. So that's oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So then the next one is max good. Yes. 
Is there a uh, is there a way you can make that document bigger? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Four hundred and two thousand. He's the head coach coach of men's basketball. Yep. Then you have Victor J. Gold, JD. I'm assuming JD is not a part of his name. He's the dean of the law school and he makes 387000 Then there's uh, the dean of business, makes 361. Dean of school of education, 343. Uh, dean of Bellarmine. Bellarmine coming down in the middle of the chart, 317. He was my dean when I was there mm -hmm. for a while. Um, well, I, can, I, this, I was there at the time. Yeah. I was there yeah. when this happened. Uh, yeah. uh, Richard Lum, same salary as uh, Paul Zaleza. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say his last name. but Yeah, I believe Zaleza. Yeah. Zaleza, okay. Yeah. Thomas Fleming, uh, C -E CFO is 313. I would have thought that the CFO made more than the Dean of Bellarmine. Hmm. You'd think. Chief and academic officer, Joseph Hillage is uh, 311. Yeah. Now let's, let me stop on that because okay. they don't list it here, but he was also listed as the provost. Now I, I don't quite recall if they appointed him provost after this because he was provost when we were unionizing in 2013 and 2014. I think but, provost uh, means chief academic officer. I think. Exactly. I believe you are correct. So that means that the provost and chief academic officer was not the second or third or fourth highest paid employee at the school. He was about halfway down. Now, far be it from me to, to dictate to LMU how they should pay whom, but it's just interesting that these 17 top paid administrators, this adds up to about $6 million. Six yeah, million and I, I'm, what strikes me is how how big this list is i mean yeah. you, i mean i don't even see the whole list and you're scrolling down and it's it's there's the bottom of the list it's, a, it's in the quarter million dollar range or more yeah. yeah now by comparison the average adjunct at this time if they were teaching two courses per semester for two semesters so that's four courses a year at the time they were making if i recall approximately four to five thousand dollars per course so multiply that by four. So we're talking about a maximum of $20,000. So $20,000 for work for somebody working, well, technically it's only part-time, but that's still more like two thirds time. So they're making what, $20,000 as opposed to these folks who are making a quarter of a million dollars and there's a lot of them. And just think about the systemic issues here when you've got the second highest paid employee at the school is the men's basketball coach, not the provost. But the men's basketball coach, yeah. now I know that the, the sports, the athletics, they bring in a lot of money. That's important. The school needs to survive. But what does that say about how they value academics? All right. If, if, the, yeah. if, if very little money has gone into improving academic or instructional salaries, and yet we've got the men's basketball coach making just a little under a half a million dollars a year. And by the way, the current men's basketball coach is making in excess of $600,000 a year. This is of course, uh, nearly a decade later, but you get my point is that's, that's a nice salary Good for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. There, and think of, yeah. 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 I mean, now everything, mention, I, everything you just said. Yeah. Let me mention one other thing. So when we first started our union drive in 2013, 2014, the VP of Human Resources, who's a perfectly nice person, you know, I, I did deal with her on a on a variety. I, I of remember her. Committees. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I it, met her a couple you know, times. We were on committees together. She's a perfectly nice person, but you know, it, it was part of her job to try to dissuade us from having a union. The university didn't want to did not want a, uni a union, so she held some meetings trying to um, convey the university's standpoint and, and explain to us why a union would not be a good idea. But I remember one of the things she was saying regarding the, um, that our union dues would be going to pay those, those overpaid big union bosses. And I would just like to mention that the president of the SEIU, the union we were organizing under at the time, was and still is Mary Kay Henry, who was making approximately the same salary that the VP of Human Resources was making at that time. So here's the VP of, Un of Human Resources, 
the VP of questions. Human Resources is reported as Rebecca Chandler, 232, and this is in 2011, 232,000, 2011. Yeah. And uh, as I was mentioning, Mary Kay Henry was making, uh, and I'm going to put this, uh, I'm just going to drag this over. Uh, this is from a PowerPoint that I had been using. Uh, she had been reported at that time as making $256,000.65 that same year. And she had over 2 million members of SEIU under her care, be it employees or union members, as opposed to maybe about 1,000 employees at LMU. So Is it that many? 1,000? I don't know. I, I haven't. That seems really high to me. Out, yeah. I'm just thinking in terms of every professor, custodian, um, you know, all the administrators and everybody. If we're talking about a thousand people, I, it's maybe that's a lot. Maybe that's a high number. How many students um, does LMU have typically, like in I, the last five years or so? Yeah, it might be about five to seven thousand. I, I don't know. I don't have those statistics in front of me. Does this include the law school? That's a good question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, okay. The we mentioned earlier, Victor J. Gold, the uh, oh, dean right. Of law school. Yeah, there yeah. you go. That's right. Yeah. OK, yeah. so Rebecca Chandler is um, and I, I had a meeting. I had meetings with her in private about an issue that mm -hmm. she dealt with very quickly and decisively when I was there. I remember her very well. Okay. Um, I did have to uh, ratchet up my rhetoric a bit before she did <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> She didn't take me seriously at first, mm -hmm. but she uh, I, I don't have any issue with her personally or anybody on this list. It's it's not about that. It's about how big the list is. And she's she's the lowest on the list in terms of salary, 232. Exactly. OK. Yeah. And yet that big that big union president that we were talking about is making just slightly higher than she does. So it, so really, who who? who where are those big paid union bosses? Now, I know some, some unions do have fairly highly paid people. That same year, just for comparison, uh, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, President Randy Weingarten was making $428,284 uh, just a couple of years prior with less than 1 million members. So yes, some unions do have some pretty big bosses, some pretty high paid bosses, yes. But we were organizing under SEIU and I wanted to make sure that people knew that I believed in SEIU, SEIU. I believed in, and I met Mary Kay Henry on at least one occasion, and I met some of the, um, the vice presidents of SEIU on occasions, and I thought they were good people. I trusted them. Yeah, I wanted to know, okay, so that's the top range of the management cadre there with the unions, mm -hmm. but how big is that cadre of, of administrators for the unions? Is it the same size? Is it, is there 17 administrators or or uh what do you what would you call them executive leadership for the union that, that's a great question. i don't know i, I, but, I, did but, look I mean at, you, yeah. you've established your point in that the top yeah of of the seiu is around the bottom mm -hmm. of loyola marymount and yes. that's a nationwide organization yeah yeah um i did look at a um a document the other day which had supposedly some of the highest paid or the the, the higher paid employees at, at uh, SEIU and I don't have it accessible but it seemed a lot more reasonable in fact I was kind of I was kind of befuddled I'm thinking wow there's a lot of people on this list making forty thousand dollars as opposed to 140 or 240 and I was thinking that's that's modest that's modest so yeah I, I I, I know that probably a lot of your viewers might have some concerns about, about unions and unionization. I know that there is uh, traditionally a little bit of consternation about unions among more conservative audiences, and I understand and I appreciate that. Um, you know, and you know me, I'm coming at this from a bit more of a moderate perspective because I don't consider myself either a conservative or a liberal. I'm pretty middle of the road. There are certain issues uh, on which I'm a bit more conservative, certain issues I'm a bit more liberal and so forth. I, I just, I want open conversation. I want truth. I want to make progress in the world. Um, with respect to higher education, I do believe that the unionization of adjunct faculty and other contingent faculty, and I know I've used that word a couple of times, and hopefully your listeners will remember we're talking about anybody who's non-tenure track, 
even if they're full time, it's a year to year contract, like visiting professors, even myself, I am contingent or term, sometimes they call you term. Um, but visiting professors, instructors, as well as part timers and other adjuncts, I believe that the best way to change higher education for the better, especially with respect to instructional salaries, is to get unions because it will give the instructional people, the faculty, a lot more power and a lot more leverage. And I'll mention one other thing, and this came from a, uh, a member of our union movement a number of years ago who himself was a bit more conservative. And I know that unions tend to skew more liberal, of course, but he was a, a representative of more conservative factions. He had said that he feels that that there really is no, um, what would you call it, um, contradiction for him in terms of unions in higher education, because he feels that in higher education, both sides of uh, the um, the supply and the demand are being controlled by the same party. Supply and demand are both being controlled by the administrations, by the institutions, the universities themselves. And if we really want a free market, then we need to break that up a little bit. And unions are the way to break that up. And I joke around about, uh, you know, I mean, we have corporations. Corporations are essentially unions for people with money. So why not have a corporation for people who are the workers, the, the professors, and the corporation protects our interests? and make sure that, um, that we're being paid a fair wage and we have leverage at the bargaining table and we can negotiate. So for me, that's why I think unions are good for higher education, maybe not for other fields, for other professions, but for higher education, I think that's the way to start breaking up this monopoly that administrations, that bigger administrations have, that a sort of a death grip that they have on the educational exercise. Well, as long as it's geared toward a view of academic excellence and student maturity, student mm -hmm. achievement, which I would say includes maturation and taking responsibility for yourself as your own work. Um, if, if it can create a, a place in, in a better way of, um, of, um, making sure seniors leave knowing how to do footnotes. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you how many times I've, I've encountered upper level students that don't know how to do footnotes. This is America, man. We're creating the, uh, the environment we're going to be old in. And, uh, you know, so I I'm, I'm all for separation of powers. That, that's the word I would use is separation of powers. I think it's good. Yeah. Breaking up too much power. Uh, administration. So there's a regulatory environment here that uh, the universities don't really directly control. They're reacting to it. To, mm -hmm. to some extent, I think they're perpetuating it. The regulatory environment that creates these conditions that hurt students um, because the regulatory environment that creates the labor laws that can in turn uh, hurt students, the, the regulatory environment that encroaches on, for example, economic liberty, where um, there might be a, a freer market and higher wages because of that. Mm. Um, you know, to the extent that you're creating students and, and voting citizens who are get engaged on a slogan basis only, slogans, uh, you're not going to solve these deeper problems because the deeper problems require deep work. To go mm -hmm. back to Cal Newport's uh, book, Cal Newport is focused on entrepreneurship, but the same principle is in solving these persistent systemic issues. It requires a, an attention span. That's why I always pound the the I pound the drumbeat of of providing support for professors who don't inflate grades because 
if you have enough of those professors, the students have to uh, develop more of an attention span. And it's, it's an attention span. It's a, it's a capacity to follow an argument, to check your triggers, to uh, focus on maybe something you don't want to hear, but to, to, to see a bigger picture so that you can clearly, more clearly see the problems that need to be solved and, and potential solutions that don't just mean, don't just reduce to like some slogan <laughs> that you might see on a bumper sticker. So, um, I, and I, I, I don't know the details I, here. I can, I can speak from experience though, having been protected by unions before, mm -hmm. and that is that it's, um, sometimes hard to see the benefit when you're there sometimes it is sometimes it's not but, but i would say on behalf of the union that what it typically does is it puts an extra layer of consideration on the part of the administrator's discretion so the administrator might have discretion to hire somebody for the next semester for example um, when it comes bargaining time for what's going to be in the contract, there's an extra layer, an extra um, oomph, I would say, in maybe pushing through things you wouldn't ordinarily be able to push through in a contract, which would be totally reasonable and helpful mm -hmm. for the student. For example, maybe lengthening the contract, getting that number higher should be yeah. higher uh forcing the the uh the people on the other end of the bargaining table to maybe cut into their own salary more so they're feeling the blood to you know to to, to solve this other issue which they wouldn't do otherwise because why would they you know mm -hmm. there's no yeah the, the, this adjunct is not going to be here next semester mm -hmm. i will yeah so you just have to wait them out um <laughs> you know or or it, it might be that the the there is a there's an economy of, of administrators out there there's supply and demand and if someone's a quote-unquote good administrator meaning it's hard to know what that means <laughs> what a good administrator uh maybe they check all the boxes of the die diversity inclusion so that their picture on the website presents a picture of the university to the some of the woke people out there that see how with it we are see how moral we are we are so moral and we are definitely not ku klux klan members here you're not going to find any klan members anywhere on this campus i mean i know you were worried about it before <laughs> Like, well, why were you worried about that exactly? Okay, well, maybe you're not on planet Earth, first of all. But it, so there's a there's there might be that that if they cut into those salaries, then they're not going to attract the best administrators, and then that's going to hurt the school. But that's why you got to push. You got to have an institutional push against that because that that will just perpetuate and then you'll have administrative bloat and harm to the students and you'll have faculty showing up on day one which ha magically have a syllabus yeah day day one of uh, work and you've already completed a syllabus that's as ridiculous as as hiring an administrator and they have the sop already done day mm -hmm. one no that's something you develop when you're an employee you don't have that day one you you, you no, have want, to spend some time on that i wanted to ask you a question related to that issue of being expected to show up with your syllabus and your entire lesson plan already um in place i know that when i was still an adjunct up until um 2021 i think 2020 or 2021 was when my position started to change 
Um, and I know up until that, in that point in time, there were some state laws in California that were moving us in a direction of paying adjuncts for the secret time that you spend on grading or syllabus making and things like that. Um, I'm not up to date on the details of that legislation. What has changed as far as you know? Are, have you kept up with that? Well, I mean, I, it's not that I study it directly, but my background knowledge might help me help answer it. Um, if you're not an employee of the school, they're not obligated to pay you anything. You're unemployed, right? Right. So, so the, the question of when you are employed has to be settled by a contract or an agreement of some kind, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. just stipulated. Right. Right. Because there's clearly a time when you're not employed during the year, during the calendar year. Now, I, I, what I mean by that is, I mean, it, even if you, the, um, let's say that the administrator has said to you in the hallway at the water cooler, I got you on the schedule for next semester. Is that all right? What I got you on the schedule for, for 8 a.m.? is uh you know i got you on the schedule for monday wednesday friday at 8 a.m is that going to be okay for you hmm. and then of course you're biting your tongue at, <laughs> in the water cooler and you're saying sure that's awesome thank you so much for scheduling me once again for monday wednesday friday at 8 a.m instead of tuesday thursday like you did the friend that you have that's an adjunct mm-hmm because, and so I'm happy to spend 50% more on gas for the same exact pay, which is another issue. I mean, why is that not addressed? And if, if unions could do that, it, it, people who, get, who come to campus once a week get paid less than the people that come to campus three days a week. Why is that for one class? I'm saying per class. Because mm -hmm. I'm spending 50% more on gas and these are Biden gas prices. And I'm saying that because, well, when I started teaching, George Bush was president. And I, I didn't even think about, uh, you know, a Texas governor is it, <laughs> you know, need I say more? And I know, you know, war for oil and all that stuff. Don't want to get into that. But the <laughs> gas prices, whatever the cause of it, was not even an issue <laughs> for me. I didn't even think about it. Like, I, I should have been thinking about it, but I didn't. And now I do, I ha I can't, how can I not think about it? It's, it's $6 a gallon here, seven. Yeah. And so those kind of very real issues of, of a negotiation, will you take this class? Will you not take it? Um, well, even if you're on the schedule for the next semester and your contract ends, you're not a W-2 employee of that mm -hmm. school. You're eligible <clears throat> if you don't have reasonable assurance, if your new contract that you may have never even seen yet is not is, is contingent in any way on enrollment, funding, or program changes, then according to California state law, you're you're in you're eligible, you're otherwise eligible, I should say, for unemployment benefits mm -hmm. if you paid in mm -hmm. if you paid in enough and that will be calculated by the department they 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 have those numbers and so you're not a, if you're eligible for unemployment benefits you're not an employee mm -hmm. that's just not how it works so you're not an employee now you're eligible for unemployment benefits up until you become an employee again and so that's how I'm counting it. And so, so for example, the little thing I mentioned about the philosophy department and great inflation in, in the fall of 2017, I remember uh, getting the email and I was sitting in Cal State Northridge office, my office in Cal State Northridge. And um, I was dealing with a Loyola Marymount issue and Loyola Marymount was not paying me. The state of California was, but not Loyola Marymount. 
So the state of California was paying me taxpayer money to deal with a private rich school and some kid that was complaining about his grade. And the kid was a great inflated little beast. <laughs> that's, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Mm. Now, I did have uh, an office at Loyola Marymount. And I did have support in a number of ways that Loyola Marymount would be unjust for me not to mention. It would be unjust and unfair to them not to mention that. So in due justice to Loyola Marymount, they had the best resources of any school of 12 schools that I taught at without a union. So I have to address that and including pay. Now I was, I wasn't in office at Cal state, for example, and I will say on the other end of it, that there were places that I was taught at where the union was quite strong and I had no office whatsoever. Wow. Okay. No, I mean, a cubicle. Hmm. I'm talking about, oh my gosh, I, it's like traumatic for me to even think about it. Like I, I remember taking a picture of this guy at this cubicle. And when I say cubicle, I mean, it's more that cubicle is actually the wrong description. It's more like a phone booth. And I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Wow. Like a phone booth, if you were those old school phone booths at like in the in like a, a hotel lobby or something, it's mm. not totally enclosed, but it's like a little chair you sit at, mm. and and there's maybe a computer and a light or something, and it would be like one of those little carols study carols at the library, mm -hmm. yeah. So this guy had taught that this particular school uh, in Los Angeles Community College District is a city of Los Angeles. I took a picture of this guy. The guy had been there for 20 years teaching history. And he was in that little cubicle. And he, he was older than the 10 year. He had a lot more teaching experience than mm. the 10 years. The 10 years were walking around carefree. They don't it's like the 10, and by the way, this was right next to the tenure offices, tenure, right? I mean, the, there's no way you could miss these cubicles. There's a row of cubicles. And to come out of the tenure office, you have to go right. You look right at a cubicle and you walk down the row every time you make copies or every time you go to the bathroom or whatever. And so this is what I'm seeing as a Republican professor. I'm on campus. All of this Democrat party stuff everywhere, plastered everywhere. Not a single Republican thing anywhere, anywhere on campus. Not even on somebody's car. Not even on a student's car. <laughs> Probably somewhere. But those, you know, maybe on some janitor's like broom or something, but I didn't see it. <laughs> and this is what I'm seeing. Mm. So I don't know the politics of that history professor because he never had an opportunity to express his political mm. view. I just mm. happen to know he was Republican. <laughs> but where is he going to put his little whatever Republican issue sticker or magnet or whatever? Can he put it on the community refrigerator? No. No. It would be so, removed yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. Can he put it on the cork board? It would be removed immediately. Could, could, can he put it on the little cubicle there? It's not his cubicle. He just happened to sit there first today. Doesn't have his name on it. The students are wandering around looking for name things. All the tenures have theirs and they're why the tenures were always whistling. They're walk, walking down, not a care in the world. And sometimes they were really upset. And it was always about a Repu those damn Republicans. They were so angry. This is in <laughs> Los Angeles in California. Yeah. You can't, don't know the politics of California or Los Angeles. In a district that went for Hillary, I don't know, like how many percent. But kind of a working class neighborhood in Silmar. So there actually were some Trump signs. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some Mexican people that like Trump for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, There's a few. 
maybe mm-hmm. guns. I don't, who knows what it was. Abortion, probably abortion. Sure. So uh, the Mexicans are interesting talking to the Mexicans, the Hispanics, not just Mexicans, Hondurans, uh, Guatemalans. But so that's what I was seeing from the faculty was mm-hmm. a, 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 an obsessive concern that the one transgender student they met five years ago feels included Mm -hmm. and they have grotesque institutional issues with unions by the way with unions right in front of them and there's no pushback none at all so um now that's the community colleges and the community colleges are just an odd duck i don't know how to I, I've taught at five of them. Um, I, I will say that the Cal States, they always gave me an office, always. Never had an issue at the Cal States with office. I taught upper level. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But, um, and then at Pepperdine, uh, well, at, at Biola, they did not give me an office. Um, at at Cal Lutheran University, they did give me an office, but it was a tenure's office. So the mm. tenure said, you can have my office when I'm not here. No problem. Here's the key. Uh, it's kind of like, wow. I, I mean, I'm just like, I can't imagine just letting somebody use your office like that. It's, it's somebody you've never met. Um, it's quite quite extraordinary, I thought. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. but Loyola Marymount, we always end out loyal there would be like four names on the office door <laughs> so but it was a large office i could fit 10 people in there and i oftentimes did and uh it was a little awkward if there were two instructors there at the same time but to loyola's credit they 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 used the resources for that but i so i think when you approached me for being a union member that time that whole thing was in my mind and but as i look back on it i think that even wasn't good enough for the students for the, for higher education and so i think i am in a position right now where i am a little bit, i'm more open minded to it and i mm-hmm. think the separation of powers issue is is kind of there it's like okay yeah maybe like when you were talking about breaking it up mm-hmm breaking up the concentration of power. I think you used the word monopoly. Uh, You said that the the supply and the band are kind of controlled by the same. Can you say what you, what you meant by that? The supply and demand thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not an economist. I I don't have the specifics, but this was uh, conveyed to me by one of our, our union members Our uh, you know, one of the people that was part of the, adjunct union movement nationally who happens to be conservative and he had pointed this out that that in the current model of higher education both sides of production if you want to use these somewhat marxist terms uh both sides of production are being controlled by the same entity the supply side which is the um the the professors they're the ones producing the product if we want to talk about education as a product or a service uh, the the institutions of higher learning are controlling the professors, their salaries, their conditions of work, the contracts. They're the ones that supply that. But the universities are also controlling the demand side. They're controlling the students. There's a certain amount of power that the universities have over the students. So in a lot of ways, it is somewhat of a monopoly. Now, once again, I'm not an economist, so somebody might be able to poke holes in this or say that I'm not describing it properly. But really, the um, the the institutions of higher learning, as well as the accrediting bodies that accredit the institutions of higher learning, essentially it is a monopoly. So that's why uh, many of us are saying, well, let's have a little bit more equal representation of the faculty members through a union, so that we have increased bargaining power to be able to stand up for ourselves and to negotiate for better working conditions, which in turn uh, result in better learning conditions for the students. So that's the best I can do with an explanation. Of yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I think I would add this, and I'm not sure it's a it's a good analogy. I think it's I think it's okay. 
it could be, I could use some work on my analogies and I'm help, hopeful for feedback on that because hmm. uh, analogies are tricky. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear people say it's not a perfect analogy. Well, it's like, well, but an, the fact that you're using analogy means it's not perfect. <laughs> uh, otherwise you would just say, this is this, you know, it's, it's not the same thing. Analogies um, can be better or worse, but they're never perfect. Mm-hmm. I don't think. No well, anyway, same. <laughs> the way that Republicans use your term conservatives versus liberals, I'm going to use Republican versus Democrat because I think there are conservatives that are for unions Mm -hmm. and they typically are conservative Democrats. And what I mean by that is there could be conservative, they could be conservative Republicans too, but uh, there's a lot of Democrats that are conservative. They're Mm. interested in conserving FDR's New Deal. Mm. They're interested in conserving the Great Society of LBJ. But those were things that were opposed by Republicans uh, at the time. And now they've kind of been just accepted by Republicans for no other reason than you can't. There's no way to get around it. You have to you have to just kind of agree to disagree and then move on and try to figure out how to help uh, move move things forward. Even though the entitlement thing does need reform, I don't know anybody that's ever looked at entitlement. I don't know how how you can honestly say it doesn't need reform. Well, I was going to say that um, in terms of uh, Republicans looking at unions, the politics of unions, it would be as if, here's the analogy, as if uh, you had a Democrat professor who was being asked to join um, an organization that will make your working condition better. Um, What's the organization? Well, it's the NRA. Now, don't judge. Don't ju- you have to understand they are doing good work. So the, the analogy would be if the NRA was doing labor stuff. Now you think, well, what's the analogy? Well, the NRA obviously is the NRA. I mean, it's not a labor organization. It's a it's a Second Amendment civil rights organization. But but the labor organizations are also not just labor organizations they are political partisan Mm -hmm. groups that's the analogy that's what i was going through and oftentimes on all of the hot button issues that that don't seem to be directly related to how big my office is and my how big my paycheck is Mm -hmm. that's a very good point and and i know that is a valid point that a lot of people have over which people have concerns about unions i myself I've had concerns about that, that unions are very political and they will very often get behind certain political issues. I always say, yeah, unions tend to skew left and they tend to uh, to support um, yeah, democratic causes, democratic candidates, democratically oriented legislation, et cetera. And, and I wish that unions would stay a little bit more neutral. I think we'd have more unions today if unions were a little bit more neutral. They I would agree. It would be better for the time. union. Uh-huh. I think it would be better for the union because I think there'd be happier union members because mm-hmm. I, I can imagine that there maybe are a, a few union people that are really happy about how outspoken they are about all that other stuff. But I don't think the average union member is that crazily interested in advancing all these other things that are not directly related to the union. So I guess what I would say is the professionalization of the union actually would help. What I mean by professionalization is just keep keep on topic, you know? I mean, I understand you have these, you're very passionate about climate change. You're very passionate about not just that climate change exists, but that humans are causing it and that we humans can also do something about it at this stage. In, in a way that makes a cost benefit analysis sense. So that, that's all, you know, the co- climate change slogan that all of that is behind that. And smart people can tell. Um, I think there's some dull people out there that 
can't see that but but if 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 the unions were um more laser focused on the labor issue and the academic ec excellence issue i think all of my concerns would go away overnight tomorrow morning at 9 a.m yeah and i'd be like okay sign me up you know <laughs> i'd get i'd be the first in line yeah so um maybe part of that is just how partisan and polarized we are we're yeah. very polarized right now and that part of that has to do with social media and part of that has to do with some personalities who will go unnamed in politics and national level politics <laughs> part of it is the campuses themselves though mm -hmm. look how partisan the campuses are like and they're squirting out voters how can we not be partisan how can how can how can that be sustainable for non-polarized polarization mm -hmm. yeah and you know regarding the union issue i i don't want to suggest that the unions will be a panacea or an end-all be-all that will solve all the problems of higher education i believe that unions are a pathway a viable pathway to improvement but i think one of the biggest one of the biggest um, issues that we need to address is, as we were talking about, the administrative bloat, the adjunctification of higher education, that we have moved away from a situation where, um, where you have uh, tenure or the tenure model being um, sustained and sustainable, and that the, the institutions over the last 40, 50 years have gone in a direction of uh, short term solutions. We're trying to save money now by hiring three, four and five professors, adjunct professors to do to do those same classes that formerly were taught by that one professor who had tenure and had a long term position. And I think the biggest, maybe the biggest um, party at fault that we could blame at this point are the accrediting bodies. Because the accrediting bodies are the ones who allowed it to happen on their watch. Um, for your viewers. That's a great point. Thank you. For your viewers, um, accreditation in the United States is not the same as it is in other countries. In many other countries, accreditation is, is something that is done by the government, that it is a, a, a governmental agency that oversees it. Here in the U.S., accreditation of universities is a voluntary process. So you have all these different uh, regional and national accrediting bodies. Uh, usually the regional ones are the most prestigious and the most powerful. So here on the West Coast, we've got the- It's Wasp. a little counterintuitive to, when you yeah, say it, it that way. It's a little yes. counterintuitive for people. So I'm glad exactly. you mentioned that. The exactly. regional ones is, the, is usually the one you think of as legit. It, exactly. for, those in the, for those in the know. Yes, yeah. The national ones, I would say by certain trades or disciplines, the national ones may have more clout. So for instance, in theological studies, religious studies, the religious schools, uh, the religious accreditors are national. Um, but yeah, so, so here on the West Coast, we've got WASC, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, and that is the regional accrediting body of most of the schools out here on the West Coast. So these are private nonprofit organizations that, that, um, what would you say they they implement a plan or a procedure of how schools are to be accredited, um, certain level of oversight, checking up, reaccreditation, and so forth. Those private accrediting bodies are authorized or licensed by the federal government, usually the Department of Education. But there's often no well, not I would I wouldn't say no oversight, but there's a lack of oversight when it comes to well, what are these requirements that the accrediting bodies are requiring um you know they they require certain things like that there has to be um a catalog you know an academic catalog that the school produces that has x amount of information for the for the students such as tuition or the number of credits that you have to take to achieve a degree whatever it is but there's a lack of oversight when it comes to some of the important things we're talking about here such as do the professors have a living wage? Do the professors have um, enough professional and career support 
to do their research. Uh, are all professors given access to grants or is it on a sort of a tiered system where there is a certain classism involved? So this is where I would say the, uh, the accrediting bodies have been asleep on the job over the last 40 to 50 years. They have allowed universities to gradually decrease the number of tenure lines that they have and to hire more and more adjuncts to do the job of what originally were a very finite number of full-time tenured or tenure track professors. Um, and I think that this is, is that a, is that a matter of the frog just being slowly boiled? Yeah, absolutely. And they, so absolutely. not any one cohort of these people running the accreditation could see like the direction of this. Yeah, I agree. And, and I sound agree. the alarm or, or. Yeah. Cause it was, if you look at the charts, if you look at the statistics and there have been a number of really good studies done on this, these changes in higher education, the, the erosion of the tenure model and the, the implementation of the so-called adjunctification of higher education. And I could give you some of the links for your viewers to take a look at some of these studies, yeah. but it was over the course of about 40 to 50 years that it happened very slowly. And do, I don't do you have know any books. Do you have any books that you would recommend for people if they want to chase this down? Yeah, I, I can't recommend any books, but I could recommend okay. the studies, which are like 30 to 60 page studies, and they're done by academics. So that's the closest thing to a book. Yeah, send it, send it to me by email and I'll link it. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. it has a link, I'll link it. Yes. Adriana Kazar, who is a professor at UCLA. I'm sorry, I believe it's UCLA. I keep getting mixed up UCLA, USC. It's one of those things. <laughs> I think East Coast. To me, they're the same thing. But anyway, wow. I, no, I'm sorry. I think she... I I'm I'm I believe I'm mistaken. That's hilarious. From yes, uh, hold on here. I can I can correct this. Um, she is the head of the Delphi Project at. Let me see if I can find it. If it's USC or UCLA, I believe actually it's USC. So my my apologies, but she is an educational researcher. She has a number of great people working under her. How how do you spell her last name? K E Z A R Adriana Kazar. Okay. Um, and it's the Delphi project on the changing faculty and student. And let me see if I can, I, I don't want to waste anybody's time, but I, th I think it's actually at USC. New Yorker that I am, idiot that I am, don't know anything about the West Coast. Um, but that is probably one of the best short studies that talks about this, this, uh, the history of this. Um, if you can find also, a link to me to, to it, just send it to me and I'll put it in the, the notes. Yeah, yeah. So that'll give people in a, a sense of how this happened over the course of time. And you can look at some of the statistics and the charts. Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't think there's any one particular um, accrediting body that was more at fault than any other. They were all equally at fault. And it is an issue of the frog in the boiling pot with that the heat interesting. Turned up gradually. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. It is. Well, on it might have been that somebody voiced a concern and then they were they were ignored or mm -hmm. shouted down as a paranoid freak, like mm -hmm. a uh, people use the word conspiracy theorist, you know, like that just means that we don't have to take you seriously, this concern that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not, it's, yeah, but you're right. It did happen on their watch. Yeah. So, so. I've often felt there needs to be a class action lawsuit against the accrediting bodies, maybe against the Council for Higher Education Association, or a class action lawsuit against the Department of Education of the United States, or all of the above, making sure that they are on the hook or they are responsible for the lack of implementation of certain standards of accreditation that were already on the books that require all classes of faculty to have at least a minimum amount of access to research funding, professional support, professional development, et cetera, and so forth, that maybe some of these were not implemented. Or in some cases, there was no regulation or standard of accreditation regarding that principle at all, and there should have been. So some of these things need to be, they need to be held accountable. And I think a class action lawsuit would go a long way. Short of that, or, or before that, unions would also go a long way. That's, so that's kind of where I am. Yeah, I guess what you're saying is unions are just that additional voice in the room. 
mm-hmm. and they're they're piping up the at their best they pipe up and they magnify the voice of republican professors too mm-hmm. uh to the real concerns about the working conditions including salary uh research uh time time to do the deep work uh to uh make the classroom as as uh supportive and challenging in a good way of the students to to spur them on to maturity and excellence as thinkers Mm -hmm. and uh as researchers and people that form opinions are how how's that going intellectual virtue um growing in curiosity and humility and um fair-mindedness and those kind of things that Jason Bear, our your colleague and my former mm. colleague, actually my former supervisor at one point at Loyola Marymount, put in his book the the uh, what's his name? What's the name of the book? The something mind. I was going to say righteous mind, but that's Jonathan Haidt. The mm. virtuous mind, or something like that. It's on intellectual virtue, mm. Oxford University Press. Mm. Anyway. Anything else you want to say? No, nah, I mean at this point, I I, uh, I appreciate that you've let me go go on for so long. I've I've enjoyed our our chat. I'm sure there are other things yeah. that I could share with you about higher ed and unions and adjuncts and all that. But you know, if you're willing to have me on again, we can talk about that in the future. Always, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. We should do it. Just we should just do it regularly. Just have uh, Eric, the Eric Hour. Eric Corner, whatever you want to call it. I love and, it. And uh, we'll get your thoughts on what's happening in higher ed and how to make things better. Systemic issues and yeah. just because I'm I'm really I, I feel it's really important that we have open and honest conversation about a lot of different issues. There's there's too much entrenchment and siloing going on in our society. And I think yeah. you know it's it's so important that people like us from different ends of this of the political and 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 um you know philosophical perspective uh, spectrum that we we really we talk with each other and we honor yeah. each other's points of views and somewhere in the middle there's going to be some answers wow um i know yeah, a lot of people who listen will love what you just said thank you thank you uh you know i, I want to highlight in the future i just let me say let me give a little um like um, um, wetting the appetite, I suppose. In the future, I want to talk about multi-faith, uh, you know, interfaith dialogue, multi-faith dialogue, which is something that tends to skew left. But I have found that there are a lot of more conservative and conservative Christians who are also involved in the multi-faith endeavor. And I want to highlight that. I want to support and encourage and highlight that because a lot of times they don't get the attention they deserve. And I've, as part of my next book that I'm just starting to research now, this is after the exile, I, oh, I'm wow. talking about the interfaith movement in the United States. And I want to highlight some of the more conservative Christians who are doing really great interfaith work and often never make it to the table when there are your usual garden variety interfaith events that tend to skew left. So those are some of the things that I, I want to talk about. Sure. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. A lot okay. of Baptists, sure. a lot of Baptists involved. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Great okay. people. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Dr. Eric Greenberg of Loyola Marymount's uh, University in Los Angeles's theology department. And thank you, Dr. Mather. I appreciate it. And it's good. I'm glad to see you still up in the uh in the Bay Area there, and it never seems yeah. the sun never seems to set. It's cold uh, up here, but and the, yeah, the sun never. That's right. You always get me right before sun. Is that sunset or sunrise? I guess that's sunrise. Who took this picture? I don't what know. Kind, what kind of picture taker is this? Oh yeah, that's definitely sunrise. Is it? I wouldn't that's, know. That's the Bay. That's looking into the Bay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so that would mean the sun is coming up over the east. Because it would be going down over the ocean otherwise. Yeah. So that would be, uh, anyway, people who are listening on here have already checked out because they can't see what I'm talking about. I'm on the Marin Headlands in the background on our Zoom call, and um, it looks like I'm homeless. 
And it wasn't how you would describe me as homeless. Oh, um, because you, know, you know I'm wearing a tie. Sure, I'm wearing a, a yellow power tie, and yellow power tie just means I'm afraid, and I'm gonna just, you know what, just keep going. I'm afraid. Okay, <laughs> son, of, son of man has no home. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us, Eric. We'll see you next time. Thank you, my friend.